My guest today is Mr. Tom Maidment. He's a sustainability engineer with experience leading decarbonisation projects in agriculture and industry. He's also the technical director of eMission, a consultancy he founded, which is committed to improve public understanding of the carbon footprint of food. Uh, he's an active environmental activist. In Coventry, he's produced an analysis of the implications for Coventry of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, on 1.5 degrees C of warming, which was published on the CovCam website. And I'll put a link to that in the notes. Okay, so yeah, anything else that you do? There's lots of other, other small things I do, but that's sort of um, a, a good summary of what I do. Um, okay. Obviously, I, I do a lot around climate and around uh, other environmental issues as well. To a yeah. yeah, yeah. So emission, um, on there, there are various um, recipes that people can use to produce low carbon meals. Um, and there's other things as well. Um, do you want to summarise briefly what people can get by visiting that website? Yeah, so Emission uh, was founded out of uh, a realisation four years ago that we really have a, a clear understanding of... Um, it was founded out of really five young people um, who kind of said a lot of the narrative around kind of climate change, climate action, is rooted in hard infrastructure. It's rooted in um, solar panels, electric cars, um, insulation even, um, which are things that if you don't own your home, um, if you don't have a car, um, can feel quite isolating. And particularly for other marginalized groups, for young people, but also for, for, for marginalized groups, for people without lots of money, um, that can be quite isolating. And actually food is a change that you can make tomorrow at a very low cost and often at a lower cost. Um, and, and has a contribution to the environment. About 30% of global emissions come from um, food. So, so we, we found it on that basis. Um, emission is now a consultancy, so uh, a few of us are still involved. And we brought in some new people as well. Um, we're developing some tools to help people understand that that's very exciting. That'll be, um, we've developed a sort of prototype. We're, we're um, still uh, preparing that to take to the market and, and we're, we're certainly looking for investment in that as well. Um, a tool that you install into your browser that can automatically carbon count any um, recipe website. So you have BBC Good Food, you go to that sort of website, um, it'll automatically carbon count it and then give you suggestions for how you can reduce those emissions. So you can make choices both on the uh, ingredients and on the recipes. Um, and then you can use that to inform your food choices. Um, but we're also, uh, we've developed a, a number of uh, educational tools uh, and we provide consultancy to the hospitality industry um, and, and to wider industries as well, um, within that as well. Um, if you go to the website, there's some resources, as you said, um, some low carbon recipes, um, but also some resources, a little bit more about what we do. So the amount of people's carbon footprint based on their food What's the, what's the approximate figure? About thirty percent. So, um, thirty. Yes. Okay. Uh, it, it's the biggest single thing you can do tomorrow to change your footprint. Um, it's broadly similar to so the emission generally the emissions from uh, people's well thirty percent of global emissions come from food the food system, um, and that compares similarly with um, transport. And I, I think we hear a a really clear narrative and heard that for a long time around food uh sorry around um transport in a way that maybe we haven't with food um and actually the the, the food choices you make can in many cases be more impactful it's really interesting when we look at the, the data for uh individual recipes um you see a real um kind of long tail of the recipes so when we did um this work that the median um dish portion is um, just over, it's between one kilo and, and two kilos of CO2. But actually some of the really highest impact dishes were um, in the kind of uh, almost a hundred kilos per, um, per dish uh, of CO2. 
And what our tool allows you to do is shrink that tail. So most males don't change, um, but by changing sort of that 20% that's that long tail, you can, uh, we achieved 80% reductions in our, our trials. Um, and that's something that we'd be really keen to, we recognize that those 80% uh, reductions maybe won't be what we get because it was a somewhat self-selecting sample. Um, but those sort of level of change is what the tools we're developing, I think, um, can get towards certainly 50%, 60% reductions, which is really exciting. Yeah. And how do people identify these um, very bad polluting meals? So, so that's that's the thing. Is it's not always obvious. So um, if you want to reduce the carbon footprint of your food, there's two things you can do immediately. Um, reduce the amount of animal products um, slightly, but actually it's not just about that. It's about which animal products and that sort of thing. And quite often animal products, particularly things like cheese can be better, even though per kilo they're worse. Um, but the main thing you can do is kind of, the, the, the one thing I think there's no place for in a, in a food system is air freighting. Um, so things like, um, if you have asparagus out of season, it's about 30 times the footprint it is in season. Um, and, uh, there's no real reason for that. Just have asparagus in season. It's great. It tastes better. Um, and, and similar with other, those sorts of things that are perishable, but have a clear season, um, they need air freighting. Um, and, and that's what you can cut out of your diet. But the thing with this tool is it's not always obvious. Um, so the tool allows you to look at a recipe online and say, oh, okay, so what's the biggest footprint item and what can I do to change it? Um, and it just it improves that understanding in people's mind of, of the footprint of that food. But I mean, it's not it's not good enough, obviously, to say I'm going to have asparagus because you need to know where the, where is the asparagus come from. Yeah, exactly. But you can Im imply that. So uh, if you're on a website for asparagus in December, that asparagus has been air freighted. Um, if you're looking. Uh, at its sort of now-ish, um, it's likely that it's been growing in the UK, maybe a bit later, but um, you know, that, that sort of thing is quite clear. So um, the tool doesn't go deep, it doesn't need to, um, because the food system is one of, of, of averages, really. Um, yeah. You can try and trace every, every um, grain of rice, from the field to the fork, but actually most rice is produced in the same way. So it doesn't make a huge difference. Right. Um, you know, you can try and trace every carrot, but every carrot is both very small and the variations don't make a huge difference. Um, and where they do make a difference, it's quite obvious. Um, so we're, we're able to sort of apply that, that to our technology to kind of um, build a clear picture of, of the emissions. Because the consumer, um, when they're going around the supermarket, um, they might, I don't know if they would, but they might want to compare, you know, the emissions from this food, just as they compare the amount of fat and whatever is in the food. Now, the, 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 the ingredients, the, the fat and the sugar and all that are already marked on most foods but the amount of greenhouse gas isn't. Now, as I understand it, Tesco did an experiment some time ago where they're actually marking foods with the greenhouse gas that that food was contained. I'm not sure how they did it. But it, in fact, I think they, they stopped doing it. Nobody else was following them. Um, and I can't remember why they actually stopped, but do you think, do you think that, they, that supermarkets should be marking their food up in that way? I think it's likely that we'll see carbon labelling of some kind um, proliferate. We're already starting to see it on some products. So uh, corn carbon label their products. I, I, I think, yeah, it's pretty inevitable that it's coming. Uh, we're seeing a lot of um, retailers globally examining it. Um, we're seeing some restaurants the thing with um, the food industry, you have a very small number of retailers, let's say 10-ish in the UK, mm. not that many globally, even hundreds, but not, not more than hundreds. Um, 
in the so a lot of these things happen in food service they happen in um restaurants basically um and you, you're starting to see restaurants put um carbon footprint on menus so i think it's uh, and you're starting to see some retailers take an interest as well but i think um that's what you i, I think it's inevitable that, that some level of carbon labeling is going to come and, yeah. and you can already see it happening it's uh, just one of those things about how do we standardize it how do we agree what's a good yeah. enough how would a restaurant work out the carbon footprint of their rest if they devise the recipe themselves they pay us they pay emission oh right okay um or, 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 you know, they'll use one of our tools. We're, we're also developing tools for restaurants um, that allow them to, to essentially do that, a chef to sort of carbon count as they go along. Okay. And then you mentioned this, um, I, I think it was an extension to a web browser, was it that you could use? So, or was it an app that you installed on a... a yeah, no, a, a web browser extension. So does that know what country you're in? Because obviously the... You know, what's in season in one hemisphere is out of season in opposite hemisphere. So does it does, know? Yeah, does yeah it so, so that's that's the sort of thing you've got to um, understand. Um, it, hemispheres make a difference. They don't make uh, a, a big difference, really. The, the thing is, we have such a globally interconnected... You're, you're right, they do. Um, we have such a globally interconnected food system that um, actually a relatively not small, but a, a change of country, going from the UK to Spain, you get a lot of things in season a lot earlier. Yeah. Um, but th those are the sort of things that, you, yeah, wh where you are makes a difference. We're in such a globally interconnected food system that it makes a difference only on quite a limited number of products, but uh, it's certainly something that uh, we're building into the tool. Okay. Um, is, is that sort of uh, seasonality and where is it seasonal has to depend on location. And the other thing that struck me when I was looking at your website, you've got a number of recipes on there. Have you ever thought about producing a recipe book so people can, you know, buy the, buy the recipes and, and follow the book? I, I, I'd say I think we'd, we've worked with um, recipe creators and that would be more where we'd focus. Um, it's not our core skill set. We don't have a... Um, a chef who is part of the business. Um, I think it's probably not not where we would focus, if I'm honest. Yeah, I mean, it would it, it would be cool, and 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 definitely we'd be interested to work with someone else who was that was more their skill set. But um, it's a lot of work for potentially, um, and a lot of work for us to do a lot of the the cookbook stuff where we're not specialists. Um, and we'd much rather, you know, we, we'd be really open to working with yeah. uh, a, a recipe book producer to kind of yeah. have that as part of it, particularly if someone was looking to produce a low-carbon recipe book. Yeah, yeah. Because I think there are some, I think I did some research and I actually bought one some time ago, but there are not many. And I don't think they give the same information that you give on your website. I need to... Oh, big green cookbook, it says. Yeah, but it doesn't it didn't give the same information that you give. Okay, so there's a market opportunity for a publisher there. Um, but like you say, they need experience in that market because it's not. Yeah, I'd, I'd be really keen for them to reach out to us, emission.org.uk. Um, yeah, yeah. kind of look at that. Yeah. Okay, so going back a little bit in time, um, I mean, how did you get where you are? You presumably went to university somewhere, didn't you? What did you do? Uh, so I, I was very lucky. I studied automotive engineering with sustainability. Um, when I was 18, I got uh, onto the undergraduate program at Jagger Land Rover. I spent five years um, working on electric cars with them. Um, then I uh, was very fortunate to be uh, join the graduate scheme with, was uh, in the uh, responsible business team and was in the right position at the right time um, and, and worked on developing their net zero strategy. Um, and uh, the, the uh, 2039 net zero strategy and the science based targets behind that. Um, and, and right. who, who, who was that with? With Jaguar Andre, with the car maker. Okay. Um, 
that was a fantastic experience really set me up whilst I was sort of in my last couple of years um I founded emission I also founded another startup looking at biogas which um we sort of mothballed um called grass um that was looking at um gas from grass um and those those were also very formative obviously very much uh more in the, the food and land sector my background uh, is from agriculture. I, I grew up in a very rural area. And um, I think as well, that the more interesting challenge to me, um, I, I, I finished that at Jaguar Land Rover and I very much was uh, clear in my mind that the next step I was gonna have to commit to a few years um, to really implement this. And, and I'd sort of, I'd stra- set the strategy and, and really seeing it through into implementation. Um, was a going to dilute my role a lot and also um was going to be a, a a bit of a commitment and i kind of decided now's the time to jump i was really interested in um the food sector looking at how we can uh build land for me net zero is really a question of lowest possible emissions in industry eliminating combustion emissions but you, you're still going to have some industrial emissions um, from processes like cement, steel making, those sorts of chemical processes where you just produce CO2 because you start with carbon in some kind of solution. You know, cement is essentially a process of turning calcium carbonate into calcium oxide. How are you getting CO2 out of that? Um, and that there are, you know, low carbon cement processes, but um, nothing that gets you to zero. Uh, and it's the same with steel, it's the same with other things. So for me, the land sector was A, behind, um the other sectors partly because it's it's hard in the land sector you're not just looking at co2 you're looking at co2 but actually primarily you're looking at methane you're looking at nitrous oxide and to a lesser extent you're looking at fluorinated gases so you've got four um gases that all operate in a different way sorry um, sorry tom by the land sector you mean agriculture or what i mean primarily agriculture um but to a lesser extent also as forestry um and i deliberately call it the land sector because it's not just agriculture it is land um and really in in that land sector what you have is a carbon sink you have a sector that should not just be carbon net uh, or shouldn't just be net zero it should be carbon negative it should be the sink that offsets and and offsets against the residual emissions from those industrial Mm -hmm. um processes and i think you look at some of these steel companies, the money they are already spending on carbon on their emissions because of um, government levies and that sort of thing. Um, and the trajectories for those, there's a clear and um, very interesting market there for uh, the land sector that I think they're not exploiting. And the other thing is, is in the land sector at the same time, you have a very interesting challenge of sort of um, demographics. The average age of a farmer in the UK is 60 there's more farmers over 80 than under 44. So there's a real interesting, how are we we gonna feed the population that, that, you know, for the next kind of 30 years, while similar or, you know, ideally less than that, I think we can get 2040 as an aim for the land sector to get to to zero. And and then beyond that is is sequestration. Um, That for me was the challenge I wanted to take up and I'm very fortunate I've been able to. So are you working on that as well? Yeah, so I now work um, for a large food company, Hilton Food Group, who are one of the biggest companies you've not heard of. Um, They're a huge supplier of um, proteins around the world to to various retailers. Okay, fantastic. So, I mean, so you're talking about sequestration. So what do you think about carbon capture and storage? Is that that going to happen? It's not one thing. That's what I think. Um, carbon capture and storage is a number of um, different technologies, really. So there's biological um, carbon capture, sequestration. There's about five gigatons of that globally possible. Um, I think that has to happen and has been happening forever. Um, it's that, That's what I'd call the short, well, it's what is called the short carbon cycle um, in terms of uh sh- you know short-term carbon storage and and that has to be a managed sink um there's then sort of geological storage 
which is basically putting the carbon you took out of the gas well and the oil well back into the oil and gas well, or it's turning the carbon you took out of the oil and gas well um, and put in the atmosphere back into calcium carbonate rock, which is sort of the reverse cement process, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's really two. So, so really you've got a two, two-fold problem there. You've got carbon capture, which, and there are really two, two different ways of doing carbon capture, which are direct air capture, which is really hard because actually carbon dioxide doesn't exist in the air at a very high concentration. So trying to get it out of the air is quite hard. And then you've got carbon capture from industrial insulations, which is pretty easy because you essentially just put a pipe on top of the chimney broadly. It's not that simple, but broadly. Um, it's certainly simpler than getting it out of the air because you know in a chimney, it's gonna be a, a concentration of 15, 20%, that sort of region. Um, whereas, uh, and, and you've just got to get the nitrogen out sort of thing. Um, whereas, um, and actually the, the main problem is the residual oxygen, but that's, that's for another day. Um, but getting out of the air is very difficult. That's the carbon capture problem. I think carbon capture, certainly industrial carbon capture we have, we know how to capture the carbon. Um, purifying that carbon uh, dioxide is hard. Um, getting the nitrogen out is hard. Um, that's that's then the next stage. So that's that's kind of your middle problem. And then you've got a third problem of how do you turn what is, you know, the reason we produce a lot of carbon dioxide is because it's an inert gas. It's your endpoint chemically. So how do you then turn that inert, fairly inert gas into something like, you know, a carbonate rock or a, a stable form? Well, A, one choice is you don't, you put it in a geological storage well, like a gas well, but Frankly, gas wells aren't super tight, uh, super airtight in many cases, and also there aren't that many of them. Or you turn it into something solid and stable, and that uses a lot of energy. Absolutely. So that 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 for me is, and so for me, the the carbon capture we sort of have, but really doesn't work at more than sort of. I mean, an indu a scaled version maybe you're getting 50% capture, which isn't good enough for a new, to justify a new installation. So for me, carbon capture and storage um, on industrial installations is probably part of the solution in the short term. I think it's, if you're putting carbon capture and storage on existing installations that you built now and are intended to have a long life for 40, uh, 50 years you know some of these industrial installations have those sorts of lifespans on them right. i think it's a good way of grandfathering the embedded emissions on that asset so something like a steelworks that you build and that furnace is meant to last for 30 years and you've just built it i'd say that was a dumb thing to do but i'd also say you know so let's abate as much of those emissions as possible and not write that asset off because there's a lot of money, but actually a lot of embedded carbon in that asset. There's a, you know, um, at an estimate, I would say a few hundred thousand tons of CO2 in embedded in that. So let's not get that in our, our um, you know, let's not have to replace that somehow. Uh, a, a good stat is that um, this was a few years ago when I was working on grass um is that uh embedded in the uk gas network um there's about 5.5 gigatons of co2 that's about a quarter of the uk's carbon budget to, to 1.5 degrees um so if if we essentially write off the gas network which we wouldn't do we would essentially be saying we've got a quarter less CO2 because we'd have to replace that somehow because people still need their houses heating. Um, and that was, so it, it, I think carbon capture storage is primarily a transition technology for industrial installations. I think we have gone so far towards the red um, and, you know, we're at 1.2 degrees now. 
um, we're really, you know, that's two degrees over the safe limit. Uh, sorry, 0 0.2 degrees over the safe limit. Um, that's not great. Um, and we're already seeing its effects. I think we're going to have to pull some CO2 out of the atmosphere. So, Tom, um, sorry, I thought 1.5 was regarded as a, a limit, acceptable limit, no? It's not. Um, not really. It is now. It's it, it, What it's really called now is the best case scenario. Um, if you... Okay. Uh, when I was a kid, when I was... Probably the first thing I ever learned about the atmosphere, um, the parts per million in the atmosphere was... So I would have been... Probably 20 years ago. Um, the atmosphere... Slightly, more, uh, slightly less than that. But the atmospheric um, concentrations of CO2 with... 36 parts per million. That's where 36.org um, gets their name from, because that was the safe limit. Um, that was considered the safe limit. We're now at about 420 parts per million. So we're now roughly double the safe limit because the historic level is 280. Um, so we're, we're roughly the safe limit of, of CO2 concentrations. Um, when you consider the other gases, we're at about... Um, well, we're getting on for 500 parts per million in the atmosphere. We're quite a long way past the safe limit. Um, 1.5 degrees is the best case scenario. It's not the safe limit. 1.5 degrees, uh, as you may have noticed from the news, um, is uh, there's, there's a lot of bad things happening at 1.5 degrees. There's a lot of bad things happening at 1.2. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. Uh, going, going back to carbon capture and storage then, so you think that that's feasible in the short term? I think the only place it has in the future, or, or the primary role it has in the future, is in grandfathering um, large industrial installations that were designed around a fossil economy and probably should never have been built had we been thinking in the long term, but we've really left it too late. Um, and I think their direct air capture and lithographic probably storage has a has probably has to have a role at this point um, to play in reduction. You know, we don't just need this century to get to net zero. We need to go way beyond that. We need a regenerative century. We need to end this century with the atmospheric concentrations of CO2 lower than when we started the century. And given that in this century, we've already added 60 parts per million and we're like, you know, only a fifth of the way through, that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we need, we need to, to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere now. And that the technology does not currently exist for that. Right. So we have but a problem at scale, but 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 there is there are ways of doing it, and it is being scaled. But we're going to need to scale it more. So do that, we, that, that's the reality. We, is net zero is is the halfway point. It's not the end point. Yeah, yeah. We need yeah we need to be net negative, don't we? So I mean, so how does forestry? fit into the carbon capture and storage program then? Is it reforestry, reforestering the, you know, the wasteland that has you know, become sterile because of man's usage? Is that, and, and growing new forests, is that, where does the, is that part of the solution? Yeah, there's two, there's two ways you can think about forestry. Um, you can think about it as forestry and land, really. Um, yeah you can think of it as the UK deforested, um, you know, a century ago, uh, sorry, centuries ago, to predominantly replace it with sheep. And we have a lot of land now, and a lot of Scotland is now being reforested, actually. But um, I think forestry has to be part of it. But you can think of it in two ways. And you can think about what are we currently aforesting or reforesting? and almost say, well, that, that's a forest. It can store this much. Or it did store this much because we're still aforesting in most places. Uh, sorry, deforesting, not aforesting. Um, and, and, and now it's not storing that. Or you can kind of say, 
you can think of it and, and that's sort of the analogy i'd give to that is, is you're buying that carbon and you're throwing it away um you can also say and this is something tim searching does at, at princeton is kind of say maybe we should pay rent on that land maybe we should say any land that should that, that has historically been forested or could be forested that is not currently forested there's a cost to that in terms of carbon and we should assume that that land, that, that that cost is baked into that land um so a hectare of the uk could store you know let's say 250 tons of co2 it isn't because it's got you know a garden on it or houses or whatever um and th those sorts of things um forestry has is part of it but as i said land management technology gets you maybe five gigatons that's sort of the peak of what afforestation can do um and we are currently producing around 50 gigatons so it gets you some of the way there but it doesn't get you all the way there very far okay well, we've had, a, we've had to think about the, the bigger picture. Let's come down to Coventry then, if you, if you don't mind. So there are a number of people who criticise what Coventry City Council is doing or not doing to stop global warming. What, what's, would you like to give an opinion about how Coventry is, is, is doing to, uh, to so help solve the problem? Coventry as a city, and maybe as the city council, but just in general, Coventry, what's your opinion? 